For those of you who know me, you know that I've lived around the world and my palate likes lots of flavor and I like lots of food from lots of different places. And tonight's um, selection is called Mongolian Hot Pot. How many of you have ever had Mongolian Hot Pot? There's a few of you. So when I lived in China some years ago, I got turned on to Mongolian Hot Pot and I got turned on to it in a big way. I really, really, really like it. It's really fun and it's something that our family likes to enjoy together with friends in the winter. It's not really a dish that I enjoy in the summer. It's definitely a, a winter kind of thing and it's a fun thing for lots of people. When you're having folks over, you can do it just for yourself as well, but whenever I do it, I tend to invite friends because it's just a fun thing to share together. It seems complicated. I promise you it's not, and uh, we'll go through it together. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the sauce. So basically, Mongolian hot pot is a pot of simmering broth in the middle of your table that you put whatever you want to cook in. It's kind of like fondue. Most people know what fondue is. It's kind of a fondue, but instead of cooking it in oil, you're cooking it in a broth. So you've got a bubbling broth in the middle of your table, surrounded by lots of things to put in the broth. And each person that's dining at that table chooses what he or she wants to put in the pot to cook. And then, when you, when you get out of that pot what you want, there's a sauce. And you can dip in the sauce, or you can drizzle on the sauce, or whatever. And then at the very end, you put in rice noodles into the, the broth, and that's how they finish the meal. Now, I typically don't do that. I make my broth and I put the rice noodles right in because frankly, the kids really love that. You know, they love to slurp up those long, skinny noodles. So I made it for you tonight the way I make it for my family. So the noodles are right in there so you can get the full exposure and, and experience of what that's like. So the first thing that you do, and I've already made some here, but we're gonna walk through it is a half a cup of lemon juice. You can cut this recipe in half, but I tend to, um, the, the, the sauce tends to be pretty important and something that a lot of people enjoy. So I, I generally don't cut it in half, but if it's a smaller um, group of people or if you're just by yourself, you can certainly cut it in half. A half a cup of lemon juice, a little honey, a little tamari or brags. I did make it tonight with brags aminos, which is an alternative to soy sauce. However, I will tell you that I prefer it with tamari sauce. In fact, I prefer it with tamari sauce a lot better. And I had a hard time finding tamari sauce without alcohol in it. I never had a problem with that before, but when I went to the market and I tried two different markets and they were both out of it. Um, so I, I, I did make it with Bragg's tonight, but it's not as good. It's better with tamari sauce for, for what it's worth. Um, uh, it calls for miso, a little sesame oil. Now, sesame oil is not something that I like to get very hot. It's something that goes into cold dishes. It changes its flavor when it gets hot. And sesame oil is a flavoring not an oil that you cook with. A very little bit goes a long way, okay? So you could definitely cut this in half if you wanted to. It's easy to put more in, but once it's in, you can't take it out, right? It calls for ginger and it calls for garlic. Now, many of us buy the bottled lemon juice and I use bottled lemon juice sometimes when I don't have fresh lemons or when I don't have time to squeeze fresh lemon juice. However, in this recipe, I never use bottled lemon juice. The only time I use bottled lemon juice is if I'm cooking that thing. You know, if it's a lemon poppy seed muffins or, you know, something, something that's gonna be baked or something that's gonna be cooked. Something that's raw, like this dipping sauce, I would not use the bottled lemon juice. I actually just squeeze a lemon and, and use that instead because it definitely impacts the flavor um, if you use the bottle. So you, you uh, juice your lemon. Hang on.
hope you get the idea. I won't bore you to tears, but here's the trick that I actually want to talk with you about. Thank you, Tim. So how many of you work with ginger? Yeah, a fair number of us work with ginger. I have a genetic blood clotting disorder, and I'm supposed to take um, baby aspirin every single day, and I don't. It upsets my tummy, number one. Number two, I just don't want to take it. So I eat lots and lots and lots of ginger and lots and lots and lots of garlic. Fortunately, my husband also likes ginger and garlic, otherwise it could be a problem. But because of that, um, my numbers are good. I don't need to take a blood thinner. I don't need to take that baby aspirin every day because I'm able to do that using food. How cool is that, right? So just food for thought. Many people, when they peel their ginger, they peel it with a knife. How many of you do that? Yeah, okay, a few of you do. The, the, the good way to do it is just with a, with a spoon. You simply slide off the, the peelings. It comes right off with no problems, and you are preserving the flesh. When you chop it off with a knife, you're, you're getting a lot of that flesh, and we want to preserve that flesh because we want to use it, right? So I just pull the flesh off with the side of the spoon, and I'm not... Um, you know, if there's a little bit of the peeling left, that's not the end of the world. Sometimes around those little nubby pieces, there can be a little bit of the peeling left. Some people don't peel their ginger at all, but I typically do. So you've got your ginger peeled, and then I use just a regular grater. And you'll notice that with ginger, it's very fibrous. And depending upon what side you um, grate it will determine how hard you have to work. So if you go on the side of it versus the end of it, it will grind down very, very, very quickly. So I need a tablespoon of ground ginger. Because if a little is good, a lot is a whole lot better, right? <laughs> All right. There we go. So we will have poured in our lemon juice. We will have put in our honey, our Bragg's aminos. But again, I far prefer tamari, just saying, um, and our miso. Now the recipe calls for red miso. I actually used white tonight because I prefer the white. The red has a stronger flavor and I, I prefer the white in this particular recipe. I use it interchangeably though. It really doesn't matter whether it's red or right. If you use the red, you'll get a slightly uh, stronger flavor in the sauce, but it's really not enough to tell all the difference. Uh, the white tends to be a little less expensive so that's why I got it. You're gonna use about a third of a cup of that, and I've already put some in, so I'm just gonna put a smidgen in. And then our garlic and our sesame oil. Now remember, the sesame oil is a flavoring, so we're just using a little bit of it, okay? Once you've put everything into your blender, you're just gonna whiz it up, and it doesn't take long to do it. This is a swanky blender, but it will work in just a regular blender that you get from Walmart or any other place. Hold your ears, though. that's finished 
you're going to take it's fun, you don't have to do this. It's fun to take little individual little cups. So in front of each plate, everyone has their own little individual cup of sauce because some will want to dip it and you don't want them to double dip because that's just gross. But if it's their own little personal thing, they can double dip and it's no problem. Some want to drizzle, you know, whatever. You pour it in the little cup and you top it off with a smidgen of cilantro. Unless you don't like it. Learn to like it. It's really yummy. <laughs> I've been trying to teach my wife to like it for quite a few years. We haven't gotten there yet. Some people have a genetic, uh, not a defect, but a genetic defect. <laughs> 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 be careful. Uh, they're genetically programmed so it doesn't taste good. So when you work with cilantro, a lot of people will spend copious amounts of time picking off the leaves. Don't do that. The stems are awesome, okay? You just, just chop them right up fine because few people want to eat stems in their food. Some people like twigs and berries, but um, most of us, you know, don't really want to eat stemmy things. But if you chop it right up, uh, it's great. And then you just sprinkle a little bit on your sauce and there you go and then that goes right in front of the individual plate. Now, if you didn't want to do that, you could put it in a pitcher, and folks could drizzle it and just put some on the side of their plate. You could put it in a bowl or whatever, but I'm not a fan of double dipping, so I always do little individual bowls in front of the people. So that's the sauce. Now, on to the broth. What you're trying to create here is just a really flavorful broth. In Mongolia, they use a beef broth. Well, I don't use beef broth. I don't eat beef or anything that had a mother. So I'm creating then an incredibly flavorful broth. Now we've talked before about when you are cutting your vegetables to save the end pieces. Remember, for those of you who've been here before, you save the end pieces of your carrots, of your celery, of your onions, of your garlic, of your whatever, and you put it in a pot, cover it with water, and simmer it on the back of your stove, and it makes amazing broth. Very, very, very flavorful broth, okay? That's a wonderful thing to put in here. What I do when I make that broth is, usually I use it right away, but if I'm not gonna use it right away, then I will freeze it in ice cube trays. So then when I need to saute some onions or I need to saute something, I pop out an ice cube of my really flavorful broth and that's what I saute it in. Does that make sense? Okay. You'll find if you do that, the flavor is actually better than if you saute in oil. Yes, it, it truly is that. And also the water that you cook your corn in in the summer. I learned that actually from Dr. Howe. Um, cook your corn in the in the summer and save that water that you've cooked all that amazing corn in and freeze it in ice cube trays and it can serve the safe purpose. It could be a broth here or it could be what you saute your vegetables in when you need to saute. So it calls for eight to ten uh, cups of water and it really depends on the size of the group that you're making this food for. If it's just for yourself Obviously, you don't need eight to 10 cups, right? You could certainly cut that in half. And then, whatever it is that makes broth yummy for you. So, I always, onions and garlic goes in everything that I make, unless it's breakfast and sometimes even breakfast. Um, and the more onion and the more garlic, the better. Um, I had a daughter, my first daughter didn't like garlic. And I thought, oh dear, how did I produce that? And what am I gonna do about it? Fortunately, you know, our taste buds are trainable, right? We can teach our taste buds. We'll have a story about that later, but um, I, I, put, I put garlic in it. And this is the garlic, as I've shared with some of you before, when I do my garlic, I buy it in bulk. And I whiz it in a, in a food processor 
and I freeze that whizzed up, minced up garlic in ice cube trays. And so when I need garlic, fresh garlic, I pop out an ice cube. This was two ice cubes of garlic that I popped out of my freezer to bring with me here tonight. It's faster than every single time squishing the fresh garlic, right? And the stuff that you buy in the jars is useless. It has no flavor whatsoever, right? It, it serves no purpose. So think about freezing your garlic freshly ground or freshly whizzed up and um, it does a great job. So garlic, it calls for more ginger. Let's just imagine that I just whizzed it up. Oop, there you go. Um, I will sometimes put in mushrooms. Not, not always, but sometimes I did for you tonight. I'll put in some mushrooms and not just fresh mushrooms. I keep in my house dried mushrooms. I buy them in bulk and I use them for lots of different things. One of the things that I use them for is if I want a meaty flavor for something. And I learned this from an executive chef friend of mine. I will take the dried mushrooms and I whiz them up in a coffee grinder. And then it comes out in powder, okay? So this is nothing but dried mushrooms in powder form. And I put that in my broth because it's gonna give it that beefy flavor that you typically get in Mongolian hot pot. Does that make sense? About two tablespoons for this particular recipe. So we've got our water, onion, garlic, ginger. I will oftentimes put chili in here, a whole chili, but you wanna make sure it's whole so it doesn't have any cracks in it. It's usually dried. I also keep a, a large container of dried chilies in my house, but you don't want the heat from the chili. You want the flavor. So by making sure that the, the chili is whole, then you're cooking it in your broth and you're getting the flavor from the chili without getting the heat of the chili. The heat can be overpowering for many people and not very exciting. The heat is in the seeds yes. And then I will add some onion powder and garlic powder. Now why would I add the onion powder and garlic powder since I've got onions and garlic in here? Any, any ideas? What was that? I really like onions and garlic, it's true. Um, because it adds a different dimension of flavor. Once those onions and garlic are dried and ground and you add that to a recipe, it's a different dimension of flavor and it's gonna enhance the flavor in your broth. Does that make sense? There are times when I add a carrots, um, any kind of vegetable, any, any kind of vegetable that you want to flavor your broth is great. I did put carrots in your broth for tonight, and that's about it. We've got our water, our onion, our, our ginger, our um, onion powder, the, the, the mushroom powder. You do not have to have mushroom powder. That's just something that I add because it adds that beefy flavor. I ate Mongolian hot pot for years without dried mushrooms, but if you miss that beefy flavor, it's a trick for you to try. You can even, um, if you're baking tofu at some point, you can even sprinkle on some dried mushroom powder and bake it in your oven and it comes out with very much of a beefy kind of flavor. Any questions about that? Okay, so we put our broth on. We're gonna bring it to a boil, a rapid boil, and then we're gonna turn it down to simmer, all right? And then we're gonna move on to our vegetables. This is the fun part. So any kind of green, greens are your friends. Lots and lots of greens every day. But in this particular dish, it's really fun if you have a tray, or it could be several different trays, and you, you smatter your whatever you're gonna cook in your, in your fondue around that tray. So this is a rainbow kale, and I've already washed it, so I'm just gonna dump that right out on my tray. And then I've got some Napa cabbage. Now I will say, this is some sorry looking Napa cabbage. <laughs> Isn't that pathetic? It should be green. 
This is what it looked like in China. When I lived in China, they stacked their Napa cabbages against the north wall of whatever building, and it stayed there for months. And they would go out and hack off the end and just peel off those rotten, you know, outer leaves until you got to, you know, the inner core. Unfortunately, this was the best that we could find at the grocery store, but you get the idea of a Napa cabbage, right? So what I would do with this, if I was going to use the whole thing, I'd simply slice off the bottom. And you definitely want to make sure that you wash these individual leaves because there absolutely can be dirt down here towards the stem, right? And that's gross. Um, so there you go. <laughs> All right. Now. Napa cabbage, Napa, Napa cabbage goes in a lot of different Asian dishes as well. And typically when you do Asian dishes with Napa cabbage, you're cutting the white out. And sometimes they'll slice it. Um, sometimes they throw it out. Well, I don't like to throw anything out that has nutrition in it, right? So for the purposes of hot pot, I slice it, that white part. So you've got these fun little chunky parts and it gets laid there on the side right and then I just simply quarter the leaves and then that's going to get laid somewhere else on my tray does that make sense I've got a bok choy now this bok choy was really sad looking too they had sad greens available <laughs> Um, unfortunately but what I prefer is actually the baby bok choy are you guys familiar with that yeah most people are familiar with the baby bok choy because it's easier to eat it's easier to deal with the larger bok choy is fine you just have to slice it and cut it a bit more so this has already been um, you know taken off the stock and I do the same thing with the bok choy that I did with the Napa cabbage. I simply chunk these up, because typically in a Mongolian hot pot, you're cooking chunks of beef, chunks of pork, chunks of chicken, in addition to your vegetables. There's, so this is giving us that chunkiness and something to chew without it having a mom or hurt you, right? So this is that. And then I would do the same thing um, or a similar kind of thing with this as I did the other, except I just go right down the middle. And then I would put that on my edge. And I might put carrots here. I, I would put um, spinach here. And then I also put tofu. Now I have had difficulty finding extra firm tofu. When I buy my tofu, I always, always, always buy organic tofu, never tofu or any other soy product that is not organic. And I always buy it packed in water. They do sell some um, that is packed in like a cardboard box that is not packed in water. That is not what you want. That has isolated soy protein in it or pro soy protein isolate and um, that is not a healthy product for you, or me, or anybody. The reason for that is soy protein, protein isolate stimulates um, cancer growth. So uh, you don't really want that. Yes, you don't. So it's packed in water, and what I typically do, and should have done at the beginning, is I will pour it off, pour the water off, and I'll just sit it up on its side in the container. And while I'm chopping up the rest of the vegetables, the water is draining out of this, right? So when I go back to it, there's about that much of water in the bottom of my container. I pour that water off, and then I take it, and I just squeeze it between my hands. And you can see more water coming out, right? I just squeeze it. Now, you don't want to squeeze it so hard that you crush it, all right? Because we're going to cube this. So there you go. And now I'm simply going to cube it. Slice, 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 slice.
and then I'm going to spread that out on my tray. Does that make sense? So whatever you want to hear, and carrots would be pretty, but I left them at home in my refrigerator, sorry. Um, so you've got this really colorful tray. Just imagine that there's some amazing orange in the middle. You could do some peppers, like some sweet peppers, red peppers, and yellow peppers, and green peppers. Any kind of vegetable is fine. I'm not a big fan of eggplant in this particular dish, uh, but any of the other vegetables is totally fine. Whatever, whatever you want to eat is great. And so then what you have on your table, obviously this isn't on your table, you've got an amazing tray of vegetables and tofu. You've got your very, f you've got your very flavorful, aromatic broth, right? Slap dab in the middle. And then before each plate, you've got your little dipping sauce, right? And so when it's time to eat, I have lots of chopsticks in my house, so if you don't know how to eat with chopsticks, this is a meager meal for you. Um, but most of it, you know, you, you can use a fork or whatever. Let me grab a fork, hang tight. So then you would simply, as individuals sitting around your table, you would simply choose whatever it is that you want and put it in the pot and it will bubble away. The pot obviously has a heat source under it. It can. Um, I typically use a, um, what do you call it? A burner. No, the thing you cook food slowly in. Crock a crock pot, thank you. <laughs> I'm not blonde for nothing. Um, so gray now, I guess. So I typically use a crock pot, but some people will use an electric you know, pot, or frankly, if you get this pot boiling enough and you bring it to the table, that's the last thing that you bring to the table, it will stay hot enough during the course of your meal to, to cook whatever it is that you're, that you're cooking. We tend to have long conversations. This is like, this is a meal that takes time to enjoy, right? It's not hard to prepare, but it's one that you can enjoy over conversation. It, it cooks down, and then you take that out, put it on your plate, either dip it or drizzle, and eat. Any questions? Okay, so sounds hard, it's not, but it's super fun, and it's very tasty. And for tonight, I just mixed everything in the pot, because when I make it for just my family, that's what I do. I just throw everything in the pot, including the noodles, and they each get their own little dish of sauce, but we just dig in from there. When I have friends over to enjoy you know, something different for them, then this is what I do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, give me a couple minutes and then you can sample it. So oh, oh so sorry, rice noodles. Are you guys familiar with rice noodles? Okay. So I will tell you this is not the kind of rice noodle that I normally use. I normally use brown rice, rice noodles, and they were out of them too. This must be a run on Asian food, I don't know. <laughs> so I get it at the um, Hannaford and Topsom. They also have them at Shaw's. I've never looked for it in the Hannaford and Brunswick, but they probably have it. Um, I, when I'm down at the Asian store in Portland, honestly, it's cheaper down there, so I tend to stock up. Um, but I was out of it, and so when I ran to the store, they were out of the brown rice ones. But all you do is it comes in these little pre-folded packets. You can take a whole packet or you can just take just one, and you pour boiling water over it. Three minutes later, your noodles are cooked. Simple. It's hard to get any easier than that. But for the purposes of this, I just poured a packet in the pot, and there it is. Because that's what I do for my family. You guys are eating like my family tonight. Any other questions? Okay, give me a couple minutes. So what the soy protein isolate does is it stimulates <laughs> insulin-like growth factor. And insulin-like growth factor is uh, implicated in uh, accelerated growth of some cancers. Uh, anytime you take a purified protein, um, 
simulated. Uh, and you don't want that. That happens also with uh, Quay from the mill. Uh, that's why one of the reasons why men with the highest intake of dairy have the highest risk of death from prostate cancer because uh, dairy protein was designed by nature to stimulate growth, right? I mean, how fast do cow calves grow? Well, they put on about a pound or two a day, and that's partially from that um, milk protein, which if we uh, consume large amounts as adults when we don't really need to grow, that protein goes around and stimulates growth in something, and that's cancer. Uh, so particularly men, though women too with breast cancer, the uh, dairy protein uh, will stimulate cancer growth. Any other questions? So that whey protein that they sell for smoothies and things? Yeah, leave that in the store. Yeah, Unless you have a neighbor you don't really like, you could bring it home. And, yeah, that would work. Yeah. What about the mostly the main main? Um, what about the main made tofu? Uh, I don't know how it's made, but the reason for insistence on organic soy products is because uh, the majority of soy is made for animal consumption and it is uh, genetically modified so that they can use glyphosate with it. And um, some of you have heard me lecture on glyphosate Glyphosate is Roundup, or it's in Roundup, and uh, it allows the farmer to spray his crop with Roundup and not kill the crop. But uh, glyphosate is not a good compound for human consumption, and uh, there are over a hundred cases in court right now uh, suing Monsanto for cancer caused, uh, we believe, from uh, glyphosate.